Welcome to Spill the Tea. Today we're talking to Chris Mitchell, who writes contemporary romance. Welcome to Spill the Tea with Josephine, and today we have Chris Mitchell with us, who writes the series Feels Like, and her first book is Feels Like Healing. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about that book, Chris? Well, it's kind of a funny story. I um, started on Book Talk actually reading and arc reading and beta reading for authors. And I got into a conversation with a couple of them and said, you know, I've always wanted to write. I've always wanted to be an author. And they're like, right. Yeah. So I actually started in NaNoWriMo in 2022. And um, I just started writing. I got, I had battle with insomnia and I've got a really loud, busy house with five kids. So I just started writing at like four or five o'clock in the morning. I would just write. And a few months into the journey, I realized I might be writing more than just one book here. So I sent it to a couple of friends and they're like, well, it's, it will be a very big, thick book if you just use it as one book. <laughs> so yeah, there's a few storylines you can take from this. And um, so I sp spent some time kind of editing it down. And what I wound up having is what will wind up being five books, um, three novels and two novellas. Oh, sweet. And it is a reworked version of my life, really. So in Feels Like Healing, we have a single mom. And um, she did not set out to be a single mom, but her ex-husband is an addict. He mm -hmm. fell into alcoholism through a bunch of traumatic experiences in his life. And she is going through the journey of healing herself from the sudden shock of what has happened in her life and um, obviously take care of her son. And um, so it's, it kind of started putting pieces of me together. Funny. My, um, my like working title was did love destroy us. Oh, and as I kept writing, I realized, no, it, it feels like healing. And so in there, and I'm kind of, funny for when the book has the title in it as a line that a character says and so I like wrote that in and I was like this is perfection like <laughs> this this speaks to me so it was um kind of a healing journey for myself I had been a single mom and um I met my current husband while I was a single mom and so it was kind of an homage I guess to our love story and to me picking up the pieces of my past life with my children and um, moving forward. So I, you know, I put some humor in there and I put some um, therapy sessions between the main female character, Stephanie and her therapist to really show the growth and the emotion that she had in trying to be a single mom and take care of her kid and put her child first, but realizing that in order to put her kid first, she really needed to take care of herself. Mm hmm and um, that it was okay to fall in love with this, you know, amazing man in Wilder that appeared out of almost nowhere and just kind of integrated into her life so wonderfully. So that was that book. And I released that in September. And all of a sudden, people are like, one of the side characters, they're like, when is he getting his book? So I kind of dove right into writing Todd's novella pretty mm -hmm. quickly. And I got that out really fast. So 10 months from start to finish for the first book, and then a month and a half to get the, the my first novella out. Um, that's an accompaniment to that series. And it tells Todd's story. Todd is a family friend to Stephanie and her ex-husband, actually. And um, he stays around to be the uncle in Charlie's life, the child. And Jane is Stephanie's best friend. So they've been kind of in orbit of each other for years through the friendship with Stephanie. And it's, uh, you know, they wind up together. So it's kind of a fun little uh, quick. Todd is quirky. Everybody really likes Todd because he's punny and just kind of a dude bro. And so it's kind of it was fun to write him like giving into this love that he felt for, mm -hmm. you know, this other character. So. Those are the books I have out. And right now I'm writing Milo's book, which is the ex-husband's story. Oh, okay. So, um, so we, we get to meet his redemption story, so to speak. We do. He actually has, I believe, three chapters in Feels Like Healing. 
of his kind of his point of view um, of kind of congruently of what's going on for him alongside uh, Stephanie's story. And she will have a couple of chapters in his book um, because at, when you get to the end, I'm not trying to spoil, but when you get to the end, you realize you really kind of want to understand Milo because he at one point writes her a letter, sends her an email actually, and he's wants his redemption. And she is, you're not sure if she gives him that or not. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I think my little story needs to be told. I think enough people want to understand how this man, you, you know, kind of fell by the wayside. Like wh what exactly occurred? How did he get on the outskirts, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, his story is proving to be very tricky to write because I have to really, I really like embody my characters and I do a lot of like, Stephanie was easy because she was me, right? <laughs> but when I wrote Todd, I had to kind of do some research. Like I'm not a dude, bro. I don't, I'm not super punny or quirky in those ways. And so I had to come up with, you know, those kinds of endearing qualities. And um, Milo is a hard one because he's, very broken and very grumpy and it's almost as though he doesn't want his story to be told so as with a lot of the storylines in my books I had a dream and his female main character Milo's came to me in this dream and she was like I'll help I'll be the sunshine to his grumpy and so Clover was born and I almost want to just write her book because his book is so tumultuous in my brain and she's so fun. She's so free spirited and she's literally the antithesis of who he is absolute opposites. So it's, um, it, it's fun. It's challenging, but it's fun to write this one. She's what's needed to draw him out. So oh, to speak. for sure. Yeah. 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 So your second book is called um, feels like gathering. Do you have a working title for your third book? Uh, actually, uh, I just announced that just a couple weeks ago. Feels oh, nice. like embracing. Oh, yeah. so that's we're in the cool. feels like series. When I, uh, I'm also big on symbolism, and I, uh, it's gonna sound cheesy, but I'm a mom. I've been a mom since I was 19, uh, so over 25 years now, and I put everything I had into my kids, right? And mm -hmm. um, so anything that I can do that incorporates their initials or their um colors because I assign them colors uh is kind of fun so I actually when I decided this was going to be five total books I'm using the first letter of each of their names in birth order oh, to nice. name the titles once healing came to me I was like well my oldest son's name is Hunter so we're going to go to the next one and gathering my second son is Grady so then I'm like, well, now my, my third child is Emma. So I'm like, I have to have an E name. And so that's kind of how that progresses. And um, it's kind of my nod to, hey, guys, thanks for finally letting me do something for me. <laughs> <laughs> I so, love the symbolism behind it. I like yeah. that. And so, nobody will really get that, right? It, nobody yeah. really knows me in my personal life, but I do. Like, I, and so that's kind of the cool thing is once it's on, once all of them are on my shelf, I will know that it's all for my kids and for me. That's awesome. And yeah. so are these books like sweet romance? Or are they contemporary romance? Are they like women's lit? What kind of category do they span? Or are they are they a mix? <laughs> They're kind of a mix. So um, inherently, I have issues with a few genres. <laughs> women's fiction being one of them. I feel like it's a little sexist. So I don't like to classify myself there, um, but I did have an uh, arc reader that did suggest that I should put myself there because that's how it read more to her. Um, my beta readers all agree it's contemporary romance. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely am writing contemporary romance. Funny story though, we're in the 2010s. We're not in current, current 2020s. I went back just a little. So um, it, it's the start of texting and um, you're you're getting a lot more phone calls because you're not texting as much. It's all kind of fledgling. Um, there's dating websites, not dating apps. Like we kind of went back in time, just a skosh, just a skosh. So the music 
that like Stephanie has on her playlist is a little bit older, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but it is contemporary romance. Um, Kate Prada came up with the term diet spice and it fits me perfectly. I give you a lot of tension, but um, I close the door in your face. So there's no, there's no on page, you know, sexy times. It is all behind closed doors. I allude to it, but there is some mentions of body parts. There is um, definitely tension, passion, um, but I really focus on the emotion. Like I really mm -hmm. focus on the connection that the characters have emotional, because I feel like that's for me as a reader, that's what really brings the story to life and makes it believable. You know, two people can just fall into bed, but it doesn't mean they're compatible, you know? So I, I wanted to write the true, you know, these people are really meant to be because they really connected in that way. And I think too, that's how a lot of readers really grow to love certain characters is feeling all the feels with them. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I have, um, I mean, I've had a few people say, I cried, you know, and I'm like, well, I didn't mean to make you cry, but like, I cried writing it. So we're on the same page at least. Um, and like I said, I threw puns in there and little jokes. So it, I feel like it just kind of, it's a well-rounded story. I'm biased. It's my book, but you know, I feel like it's well-rounded and, you know, they always say, write what you want to read. And mm -hmm. I, I did that for me. So I'm my target audience. You know, um, I can relate to the single mom uh, life. And I've had uh, one of my beta readers, not even a mom. And she was like, oh, my gosh, I totally could feel this. Like, I felt like I was in Stephanie's head. I understood all of the nuances. And um, that was important to me because that's it's a pretty unique thing, that single momhood. So um, mm -hmm. if somebody who doesn't even have a child can relate in the story, then that's I've met the goal. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. develop the empathy for your reader which is awesome yeah so are you thinking maybe strategically in the future because you've backed up the books to 2010 of maybe writing about some of their offspring in a separate series or is that not crossed your mind yet <laughs> it has as a matter of fact book three so it what will be it's so complicated because I didn't even outline this great in my head but so I have healing is book one and then feels like gathering is book one and a half. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, I wanted to incorporate the novellas as half books because they're not a full book, right? They're priced differently and everything. So um, book three of this series, which will actually be book five, um, is Charlie's story, the child from book one. And there's going to be a time jump. So he's going to age up. So right now in, in healing, he's 10. Um, when you see him in embracing, he's between 11 and 12. And when we get to his story, I don't know the title of yet. Um, it will start with, it will be, feels like something with an A. Um, it, we will age him up. So he will be probably mid twenties, maybe early thirties, somewhere right around there. His story is still kind of coming to me, but um, I have adult kids. And I've been really interested in their point of view through having a single mom and being a child of divorce. And I feel like it's a story that's not talked about very often. True. And so I thought that it would be really cool to get Charlie as a young adult kind of reflecting and kind of what he took from his upbringing and carried into his adult life, what values he has what parts of him came from his time with his father or his time with his mother or his stepdad or his quirky uncle or, you know, all of these kinds of things. I thought that would be a really um, interesting story to write and then read. So um, there will be a time jump there. And I actually have plotted a interconnected series with one of the side characters from the book I'm writing right now um, that might go a little bit more um into not suspense but kind of mystery maybe so um you know I don't I think the writer's brain is just always <laughs> thinking of different stories and when I go out into the world you know somebody can say something and all of a sudden I'm like "Ooh, that's a plot line you know so <laughs> yes <laughs> it's it's never ending up here but yeah so that's um that's kind of the uh that's kind of the trajectory I think I've got. I think I'm a series writer because I do enjoy staying in that world. 
And I think doing an interconnected series means I get to stay in that world a little longer, but explore new characters, you know? Yes, which is very attractive for writers and readers alike. Yes. Absolutely. Um, it's kind of funny that you say that observing people around you and, and coming up with ideas because I've personally written, I have books of ideas that I will never get to, oh, right. but, but they are there. <laughs> I've written um, in my notes app on my phone, my, my youngest two children are on the autism spectrum. And so we go to a lot of therapies. We have physical therapies and occupational therapies. I'll hear conversations or have a conversation with one of the therapists. And I just jot down a line. I'm like, ooh, that needs to make it in a book. I have like two pages worth of notes in my phones of just the most random things that I'm like, where would I put this? I don't know, but it's a great springboard. And, you know, in those late nights when you're just kind of trying to come up with ideas, they're there. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so you have a Facebook group called Team Diet Spice. <laughs> would you like to tell us a little bit more about that because I, I thought that was a great title back to what I was saying about Kate Prada coining the term diet spice diet spice kind of falls in this gray area so you've got spicy authors and everybody knows what is in a spicy book and then you've got kind of blurred lines as to what you call a not spicy book some people call them clean inherently of course I have issues with that I don't, I don't like clean, um, closed door, fade to black. There's not really one defined kind of term, but then mm -hmm. there's definitely nothing for the writers like me who bring all the tension. There's makeout scenes and you get a little hot and heavy, but then you close the door. Like, what yeah. is that? That's kind of a gray area. So she coined this term when she started writing. And when I started writing and realizing what I was writing, I'm like, can I borrow that? Can I use that? Because <laughs> kind of fits she's like absolutely everybody should use it if it fits and so she and I were kind of joking one day like we should start a Facebook group and there it came so we are doing really poorly at keeping it up to be honest we're just starting kind of getting graphics we created the group just a couple of months ago but um we are kind of trying to build a space on Facebook for people that are looking for books that aren't quite closed door, but aren't quite, you know, hot and heavy. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the, they're looking for that there. in between. Yeah. Which is yeah. where we fall. And that makes it really hard to market because readers know what they want, but they don't know how to articulate what they want. If they want something mm -hmm. like what I write diet spice isn't a term that's caught on yet. So they're looking for closed door. They're looking. So, I mean, my hashtags are all over the place because I have to cast out a wide net, right? So that yeah. people can find my book. And um, so it'd be cool if we could get the whole industry kind of on board with Team Diet Spice. That'd be neat. But, uh, you know, goals. Get get it to be a little bit more mainstream that people, you know, start marketing right. that way and, and people start looking for it that way. Absolutely. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. And um, you have a sub stack. So forgive me, I'm ignorant of what a Substack is, and I'm sure other people are too. Could you explain that to us? So I, um, I'm te technologically challenged. Okay? I'm 45 years old, and I solidly am Gen X, even though I kind of fall in that zennial category, mm -hmm. um, because of how I was raised. So <laughs> technology and I kind of fight. And I tried to get a website up and going. And then all of a sudden, uh, newsletter and I had a newsletter going and then all of a sudden the, the rules changed and now you have to have like a domain email and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so I can't seem to get a newsletter together to save my life because technology so someone was talking about uh, Substack and I'm like well what is that and so I went and it is basically kind of like a blog slash newsletter you can sign up to get when I write a post in Substack, it's emailed directly to you. Oh, okay. um, but it is also kind of just a blog. Like it's kind of a blog that kind of acts as a newsletter and it's free um, as, you know, for the readers. And it is, um, I'm still trying to truly figure it out, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of a cool a thing. Pretty good explanation. It, it, you know, it gives you an opportunity to say more than just a regular newsletter. I'm sure most people have signed up for author newsletters and it's like, 
one little paragraph about what the author's doing and then here's my book and then here's maybe some friends books or some people that maybe you know signed up to have their stuff promote on my newsletter and it's I I kind of feel like sometimes they can be a little impersonal um mm -hmm. so I kind of think Substack is more like just kind of what's going on in my brain. I can sit down at any time and read it because you don't have to sign up to get it to your new to your email. You can just go to the Substack page. So, you know, some people don't like newsletters in their inbox. So they would just be like, oh, I'm going to go and scroll Substack today and check out the authors I like, you know, um, and, and kind of do it that way. So I don't know, I'm still trying to figure everything out, but I'm trying to get my name out there and um because I believe in these books and I feel like there are readers out there for these books that need some of the messages in these books specifically in healing I think there's a single mom out there that this book could help right like mm -hmm. it to feel like she's seen and that's that's the really important part to me is I want people to feel seen in my books awesome now your books are they wide or are they just on Amazon yeah I started just on Amazon. And about two months ago, I went wide. I pulled my awesome. books out of KU and I put them on Kobo plus. Mm -hmm. So you can get them with the Kobo subscription um, there, which is cheaper than KU just as an aside. <laughs> um, and you can also get the paperback or the ebook on Amazon. And I'm working on member technology. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on trying to uh, get them out more places. Uh, my, ultimate goal hopefully by next year is to post um all of that on my website and then you know i can everybody can just buy directly through me i hate um giving money to uh amazon personally just on a personal side so it was kind of a hard confliction there when i was going to publish a book and that, that's really the best and easiest and cheapest for an author to go that way mm -hmm. um so that you know that's just me I think for visibility for authors starting out, Amazon is great, yeah. but once you get established more, it's, it's better if you slowly take control back to yourself and either choose wide or direct selling as an author, just for your Agreed. career overall. Exactly. And I yeah. think that I probably jumped out of KU a little early, but like I said, like I kind of got to align with my own morals, right? Mm -hmm. So like I did it, I said, I'll do this for six months, but then I'm going to take you know, I'm going to take it back. I want, I want my, I want my control. I want my <laughs> things and, you know, and I don't want people to feel like they have to, because I have met a lot of people that are your books anywhere, but Amazon, because I don't support Amazon, you know? And yeah. so, yeah, I, I, it was important for me. Plus going wide, I get to have my books in libraries. So That's you true. go on Libby and you can request my book to be ordered by your, your library. Like, I think that's cool because that's how I started as a reader. You know, I, and I still do use my library and my kids use our library. So um, accessibility is the most important part to me, you know, to, to get my books out there is so that it's accessible to everyone. I'm hoping to throw my hat in the ring and get some uh, audiobooks made soon too. So oh, nice. I will have the most accessibility possible. Yeah. So um, do you have uh, like plans when your third third or second book in the series technically yeah. is going to be released or are we still working on that <laughs> well I've already moved the goalpost once um I was trying to get it out by March but life's been lifing mm -hmm. there's been a lot of changes in my family here uh it's been a little bananas the beginning of this year um I'm still kind of trying to aim towards the end of July but it might not be till September I'm trying I'm trying really hard like I said, it's it's a it's kind of a struggle book to get written. So I have the good bones, right? I've got I've got the beginning, middle, and end, but I've got a lot of filler that I need to put in there. I've got a lot of more heart. I think mm -hmm. is really what I'm looking for. Is it it's it's falling flat for me for being what I want it to be. So I'm still judging it up, and um, as soon as I have a release date, I will be posting that on my Substack and on uh, my TikTok and just everywhere. So this year, hopefully, no, this year for sure, just maybe hopefully somewhere between July and September. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to come back on and speak about it, you're more than welcome to. Awesome. And we will also put the a link to your um, other two books in the description here.
and to your website so that if they wanted to check out your Substack, they can or join team Facebook. (laughs) And uh, yeah, what advice would you give to other authors who are beginning just like you? Uh, Network. I couldn't have done this without joining um, the Romance Riot Discord and having support. I, Mm -hmm. I, I truly couldn't have. I had no idea the intricacies. You think you know what it takes to publish a book. You can Google it and it, there's still more steps that are missing. Um, and it takes people with firsthand knowledge to really help walk you through it. I, my, the friends that I've made, my author friends that I've made are just uh, everything to me because how many of them have answered a phone call where I'm like on the verge of tears because I cannot figure out how this formatting thing isn't working or, you know, anything, just any number of things. Um, they are absolutely invaluable to me. So the biggest thing I say to baby authors is network, find other authors that have already published that are, you know, willing to help walk you through it. And, um, and on, uh, on an aside on that, one of the things I did is I'm very associated with a lot of spicy authors. So I've had to start really looking for my diet spice authors. Mm -hmm. Um, You really need to network, but you really need to network kind of towards your genre and your spice level and really hone it so that you can work together. Collaboration is everything in this industry. Absolutely. Having that support group, you know, people, you don't know what you don't know until you find out, right? Exactly. And the people who've been before you, even if it's just a few months ahead, are always invaluable. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I've learned so much speaking to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.